Hello, good people. It is great to be back with you. I want to talk to you today about several things that I want to weave together. It's a little bit complicated, so I hope I can make sense of all of this. The first thing I want to talk about is the Vatican Nativity, which I'm sure you have all seen. Um, I just want to speak briefly about it and say that I think that it is ugly and stupid. Um, I think it is stupid because it is ugly, and because it is ugly and stupid, I don't believe that it is Catholic. So I said that because of one of the things that I want to talk about in this video has to do with beauty and in particular the beauty of the feminine vocation which should be on display wonderfully in a nativity scene especially at the Vatican. Now um, the Vatican nativity scene has a special role that you might not be aware of if you're not Catholic or if you've never watched the Catholic Mass from the Vatican or the Christmas Mass from the Vatican. But there is a tradition in um, the uh, Mass, the mid, it used to be called the Midnight Mass. It usually would be late in the evening. This year, it's actually going to be earlier because there's some kind of curfew for COVID that the Italian government has put in place. And so the Christmas Mass at the Vatican is actually going to be earlier than it usually is, but a lot of times it's televised to so that it occurs around midnight in um, the United States, and um, people like to often watch that Mass because of getting to see the beauty of St. Peter's Basilica and the music of the choir at the Vatican and all of that, but they're not going to be having any of that, um, any of that participation this year as they normally would because of all of the restrictions of COVID. So it's gonna be a very small um, number of people at the mass um, this year. Now, one of the traditions is that at the end of the mass, the nativity mass, the um, Pope would take the icon or the image, the, um, the um, small um, representation of the baby Jesus, which sits during the entire nativity mass in front of the altar, would then carry this baby to the Vatican nativity set and place it into the manger. And the, um, the children, and a lot of times it's children, you know, representations of children from all over the world, actual children from all over the world, would be around the Pope and they would follow him and they would have flowers and they would place these all around the nativity set and then the Pope would place the baby Jesus into the manger. And so um, one can't quite imagine what kind of baby Jesus would be fitting for this particular um, nativity display, something that looks like, <laughs> like a giant spark plug, I guess. But um, obviously that would not be fitting to have in front of the altar. And yet at the same time, the um, normal image of the baby Jesus does not fit with this nativity set, which makes it all wrong. But um, anyway, that is not my main point. My main point is that of all the times in when we would need an image of beauty, an image of the beauty of the feminine vocation, it would be now. And I feel like the Vatican has really failed us in providing that, not that those images are not available in many other settings, as they certainly are. Why is this such an important image for us? Well, it is because the role of the feminine vocation is the paradigmatic human vocation. Now, I talked about this before in one of my videos about the masculine and feminine vocation. G.K. Chesterton put it this way. He said that men are men, but man is woman, meaning that man as a generically, the um, generic man, the entire human family is in relationship to God, feminine. And God, of course, is masculine in relationship to all human beings. Every human soul is feminine in relation to God. And so the reason why the image of the Virgin Mary and the beauty of this image is so important is because it really represents not just Although it's important that it represents motherhood, it's not just motherhood that's being represented. It's actually the beauty of the call of God 
to every human being to pursue holiness. Mary, of course, is an icon of that entire human vocation because she receives the word of God and then gives it to the world. She allows the word of God to penetrate her heart. She ponders it. And, um, and then she participates with Christ in his mission. And so that is what all human beings are called to do. So Mary is not just a model for, of womanly virtue. She's a model of virtue in the full sense of the word virtue, which comes from the um, Latin word vir, meaning male. She is, or man, she is virtuous. She is the paradigmatic human in the full accomplishment of human dignity and a response to the call of God upon the human family. But more than that, Mary is a paradigm of the vocation, the call, the mission, the, um, the relationship of God to all of creation. So that Mary is not just the model of womanly virtue, of human virtue in the pursuit of holiness, but also of the entire creation. She sums up the entire creation. In essence, we can say that when God made the universe and when he created heaven and earth, he made the universe, created it pregnant already with the incarnate word. And so Mary represents, not merely as Wordsworth said, um, our fallen nature's solitary boast, but the boast or the summation of all of creation. So when we fail to appreciate the beauty of this particular icon, this particular image of the Blessed Virgin Mary um, giving birth to Christ or, you know, having Christ there in the um, in the manger at Bethlehem and all of the cosmic meaning of that, when we fail to appreciate the beauty of that, we not only lose something of a sense of the beauty of the feminine vocation as it applies to women, but also a sense of the beauty of the created order itself and a sense of the beauty of the call of all of humanity to be in relationship to God. It seems that almost nothing has been under such concentrated attack as the image of feminine beauty, especially I would say in the past hundred years or so. Um, women, the image of women seems to either be degraded and, and made more animalistic or it's um, turned to becoming more masculine and everything that is truly beautiful and that is truly feminine seems to be discarded or dismissed or um, treated as though it is of no account. When young women look around them at the world and at, at the way that women are portrayed, what is there that would appeal to their hearts and make them see their own role as women as being something desirable and something beautiful. There's hardly anything for them to see. They are asked either to, um, to look like uh, sex symbols or to imitate men. There's very little that is truly feminine and lovely that is presented to them as something that they could aspire to. And it's, I believe, creating a great deal of unhappiness among young women. That is one of the reasons why it's so disappointing that the Vatican should have um, given us this particular presentation of the nativity, one so devoid of beauty. However, I do wanna point out a, a different um, presentation of feminine beauty, one that is very Catholic and one that you might be familiar with if you have ever read The Lord of the Rings. In the Fellowship of the Ring, during the early part of the story, when the hobbits have not yet um, encountered any other members of the Fellowship, and it's just the four of them traveling together, that would be Frodo and Samwise and Merry and Pippin, 
they have gone through an old forest where they have encountered some a very dark and ominous things that have tried to capture them. In fact, an old willow tree has tried to suck in a couple of the hobbits. And um, they call for help and a figure comes through the forest to them, um, a very striking figure, one that many people really like in the story, The Lord of the Rings. And that is the figure of Tom Bombadil. I remember reading this story out loud to my children and um, they just love Tom Bombadil. The, and in fact, one of their great disappointments, I think I was disappointing to a lot of people, is that in the movie, The Lord of the Rings, they never even put in the part about Tom Bombadil. It would have been so interesting to see how he would have been portrayed. But Tom Bombadil is a character that is quite um, quite striking in the, in the Lord of the Rings. The character of Tom Bombadil is someone who is completely at home in the world, in the natural world. Um, he, he is coming through the forest and he meets the hobbits and he has gone to the river to gather water lilies and he's carrying the water lilies at, on a large leaf as a tray. He's, um, he sings all the time and he kind of bounces around and he rescues the hobbits and sends them on to his house for them to have dinner and, um, and to rest up and to, um, as they're going on their journey, to be refreshed as they're going along on their journey. He sings to the hobbits about a woman he calls my pretty lady, river woman's daughter, slender as the willow wand, clearer than the water. Old Tom Bombadil, water lilies bringing, comes hopping home again. Can you hear him singing? And then he says, he says her name. He says, Goldberry, Goldberry, Mary Yellow Berrio. So he gathered these water lilies for Goldberry, who is his lady. And when the hobbits get to um, his house, they meet her. So it's very interesting to hear the description that is given of Goldberry in the chapter um, called In the House of Tom Bombadil. And it says this, the four hobbits stepped over the wide stone threshold and stood still blinking. They were in a long low room filled with the light of lamps swinging from the beams of the roof. And on the table of dark polished wood stood many candles tall and yellow, burning brightly. In a chair at the far side of the room facing the outer door sat a woman. Her long yellow hair rippled down her shoulders. Her gown was green, green as young reeds, shot with silver like beads of dew, and her belt was of gold, shaped like a chain of flag lilies set with the pale blue eyes of forget-me-nots. About her feet, in wide vessels of green and brown earthenware, white water lilies were floating so that she seemed to be enthroned in the midst of a pool. Enter, good guest, she said, and as she spoke, they knew it was her clear voice they had heard singing. They came a few timid steps further into the room and began to bow low, feeling strangely surprised and awkward, like folk that knocking at a cottage door to beg for a drink of water have been answered by a fair young elf queen clad in living flowers. But before they could say anything, she sprang lightly up and over the lily bowls and ran laughing towards them. And as she ran, her gown rustled softly like the wind in the flowering borders of a river. Come, dear folks, she said, taking Frodo by the hand, laugh and be merry. I am Goldberry, daughter of the river. Then lightly she passed them and closing the door, she turned her back to it with her white arms spread across it. Let us shut out the night, she said. Fear nothing for tonight. You are under the roof of Tom Bombadil. Now, um, if I were, <laughs> if I were um, J.R.R. Tolkien's editor, I would have had a little bit of issue with him using the word lightly to describe her twice within two paragraphs. I don't like that kind of repetition um, in, in writing. I think he should have found another way to describe her in the next paragraph, but I'm going to let that go. 
<laughs> the hobbits looked at her in wonder, and she looked at each of them and smiled. Fair Lady Goldberry, said Frodo at last, feeling his heart moved with a joy that he did not understand. He stood as he had at times stood enchanted by fair elven voices, but the spell that was now laid upon him was different. Less keen and lofty was the delight, but deeper and nearer to mortal heart, marvelous and yet not strange. Fair Lady Goldberry, he said again, now the joy that was hidden in the songs we heard is made plain to me, O slender as a willow wand, O clearer than clear water, O reed by the living pool, fair river daughter, O springtime and summertime and spring again after, O wind on the waterfall and the leaves laughter. He is um, reciting back to her, singing that he had heard from Tom Bombadil. Suddenly he stopped and stammered, Overcome was surprised to hear himself saying such things, but Goldberry laughed. Welcome, she said. I had not heard that folk of the Shire were so sweet-tongued, but I see you are an elf friend. The light in your eyes and the ring in your voice tells it. This is a merry meeting. Sit now and wait for the master of the house. He will not be long. He is tending your tired beast. And so begins their stay at the house of Tom Bombadil, where Goldberry is their wonderful hostess, serving them and taking care of them. She has made beds for them. She has prepared food for them. Um, the, she has um, seen really to their every need. In fact, there is a very Marian moment in here, in this, um, in this encounter of the of the hobbits with Tom Bombadil and Goldberry, where they get to the point where they're ready to have dinner. And um, Tom Bombadil has come in. When Goldberry speaks of him, she says, Tom Bombadil is the master. He, the hobbits asked her if he owned the land about, and she said, no, indeed, that would be a burden. The trees and the grasses and all things growing or living in the land belong each to themselves. Tom Bombadil is the master. No one has ever caught old Tom walking in the forest, wading in the water, leaping on the hilltops under light and shadow. He has no fear. Tom Bombadil is master. So then he comes in and he asks if the dinner is ready, and it is. But at that moment, Goldberry says, but the guests perhaps are not. And then Tom Bombadil says, oh, I'd forgotten. He had forgotten to invite the guests to wash up before he was offering them the dinner. And, um, and so that's kind of a bit of a, a moment that is similar to the moment at the wedding feast of Cana when the Blessed Virgin mentions to Christ that there is a need among the among the um, wedding party that they have run out of wine and she prompts him to perform a miracle and in fact shortly thereafter when there is a description of them sitting at the table and eating it says the drink in their drinking bowl seemed to be clear cold water yet it went to their hearts like wine and set free their voices now Throughout this passage with the description of Goldberry, there is a beautiful image of the feminine and of the role of the feminine and the role of the masculine in Tom Bombadil and um, Goldberry. The description that Goldberry gives of Tom Bombadil and also the description that um, Tolkien gives in um, the narrative of the of the story reminds me a lot of um, a part of the Lorca of St. Patrick. So in the Lorca of St. Patrick, um, it begins with an invocation of the Trinity and it's the one that ends in the last part of it with the Christ before me, Christ behind me, et cetera, that passage. But in the second, where is it? Let's see the like third section of it says um, I rise today through the strength of heaven 
the light of the sun, the radiance of the moon, the splendor of fire, the speed of lightning, the swiftness of the wind, the depth of the sea, the stability of the earth, the firmness of the rock. There's that connection to all of the natural world that is seen in that, um, in that prayer of St. Patrick. It's very similar to the way that Tom Bombadil is described as the master of the hills and the rocks. And, um, and he's seen as someone who is in, is in complete control, mastery of his surroundings, but also of himself. For the ring has no power over him at all. He treats it as though it's a toy, as if something of, of no account, which quite alarms Frodo in this story. Because the um, he already, it seems, has such a great treasure in himself, in his own self-possession, in his possession of his mastery of his environment, and his possession of the treasure of this Goldberry, this wonderful woman that he has as his um, wife and for whom he has provided a home. He has provided the home for Goldberry. That is very clear from this story. Tom Bombadil himself needs no roof over his head. He is perfectly, um, he is perfectly at home in the forest and on the hills, bounding around by himself. But for Goldberry, he had to create a home. And there we see the relationship between the feminine and the masculine, the masculine creating the home, then or creating the house, and then the woman, the feminine, making it a home that they both then enjoy and to which they to which they can welcome guests, including, of course, welcoming children. Um, Stanley Harawas in his wonderful book, A Community of Character talks about the fact that the welcoming of strangers, which is a Christian, which is a great Christian action, one of the hallmarks of Christianity, includes the welcoming of children into the family, um, children that are given to the marriage by the Lord. So this is the kind of image of beauty that inspires the heart and makes someone appreciate being feminine, being masculine, showing those roles in um, the human community of the husband and the wife. In the story of, um, in the, the part of the Lord of the Rings in the house of Tom Bombadil, that chapter, there's another meal that they're having at the house of Tom Bombadil. And it talks about um, after they've had a long time of talking, let, and let us have food and drink, cried Tom. Long tails are thirsty and long listings, hungry work, morning, noon, and evening. With that, he jumped out of his chair and with a bound took a candle from the chimney shelf and lit it in the flame that Goldberry held. Then he danced about the table. Suddenly, he hopped through the door and disappeared. Quickly, he returned, bearing a large and laden tray. Then Tom and Goldberry set the table. Excuse me. Then Tom and Goldberry set the table and the hobbits sat half in wonder and half in laughter. So fair was the grace of Goldberry and so merry and odd the caperings of Tom. Yet in some fashion, they seemed to weave a single dance, neither hindering the other in and out of the room and round about the table and with great speed, food and vessels and lights were set in order. The boards blazed with candles, white and yellow. Tom bowed to his guests. Supper is ready, said Goldberry. And now the hobbit saw she was clothed all in silver with a white girdle and her shoes were like fish's mail. But Tom was all in clean blue, blue as the rain washed forget-me-nots and he had green stockings. So this is a description of the domestic um, cooperation in which the two have their own roles and they do not hinder one another, but they complement one another. Some people have speculated that Tom Bombadil and Goldberry are Tolkien's um, images of what Adam and Eve would have been in the garden before the fall, that they were an image of the unfallen human, um, human beings or the way that human beings would live with the natural order if they had not sinned. Um, I don't know exactly what was in 
uh, J.R. Tolkien's mind when he wrote this passage, when he put in this fascinating character of Tom Bombadil and his beautiful bride, Goldberry. But one thing is certain, he has painted a lovely picture of feminine beauty, a different character in Goldberry than the other characters, women, that he has in The Lord of the Rings. Of course, there's Galadriel. She's, um, you know, the great queen of the elves and very regal, um, very powerful. There's Arwen, there's, um, there's other women in The Lord of the Rings who are quite striking, but it is Goldberry who really strikes us with the beauty of a woman in, um, in her role as the queen of her home. She is also like the Blessed Virgin in that everything that she says about her home, she never refers to herself and to her things as her. She always says that she's in the home of Tom Bombadil, kind of like the way the Virgin Mary always refers everything to Christ. Now, this um, scenario of the masculine um, taking out of the natural order the things which are needed and using them to create a house that then a woman turns into a home is a great theme of many stories in literature. I was recently watching a movie with my husband, and it was a movie that had you know, sometimes when kids are young, they see a movie and it'll just kind of spark their imagination a lot. Well, he had told me a number of times that he had seen a movie called Jeremiah Johnson when he was a boy. And the movie was about a guy who goes off to live in the mountains by himself. And, that, you know, that kind of inspired him with the idea of how he would like to go off in the mountains and learn to, you know, hunt and fish and, you know, build his own place out of, out of um, logs and all of that stuff that um, Jeremiah Johnson did. And what's interesting about that story is that Jer Jeremiah Johnson in that movie, Jeremiah Johnson does not have a home. He does not build himself a house. He does not build a cabin until he acquires a woman. He acquires a relationship with a woman and also with a child. Then he, they together build a house and he has a home with her. And so that is a theme that, go, that goes all through um, many stories because that is how the world works. It is that masculine vocation to turn the, um, the resources of the natural world into a house and then for a woman to make that house a home. There's a very interesting thing that I saw in Jordan Hall's um, recent, um, a, a recent video that Jordan Hall did. And Jordan Hall's been doing a series called the Sibium Project, and he has all the stuff that he's talked about, about um, uh, Game B, right? And I, I did a bunch of videos kind of responding to his ideas and asking um, whether distributism, which is Catholic thinking about the economy, um, could answer some of the questions, the Game B questions that were being asked. Because the whole thing, the whole question is, what, how can we have a different structure to the economy and to our society, one that better meets human needs than the one that we have now? Um, and so there was this interesting exchange that I saw underneath one of Jordan Hall's videos. The video was Civium Project 10 Governance Part 1 of 2. And um, so underneath this video, because I was looking through the comments on this, underneath it was a comment by a man named, let me see if I can find it here, named Thunderwolf. And um, he's asking some practical questions about how some of the things that Jordan Hall has in mind can be put into place, particularly the idea of um, how changes can be made when we have 
the kind of power structure that we have in the current system that would that would resist change? How do we get people to surrender when they feel like they're in a position of power? How would they be um, influenced to surrender the power that they have to allow new things and better things to come into existence? So Jordan Hall is responding to him and says that his concern about this is accurate, that there is the concern of that there's a current consumer culture, there's a particular current economic system uh, from which certain people are gaining great advantage and that it's difficult to, um, to bring about a change when they have that kind of control. And so then, um, the person that he is, um, that Jordan Hall is corresponding with in this comment section, this guy named, who calls himself Thunderwolf, then goes on to ask whether there's some way to um, create the environmental conditions out of which something new might emerge. And Jordan Hall responds this way. He says, egg plus sperm plus womb plus, and then he puts parentheses, he says, the rest of the right context. And I just love that comment. <laughs> I thought, oh, this is so great because Jordan Hall is, to me, he's kind of a thinker in a way um, similar to Jonathan Pajot in seeing the way that the different levels of things stack up. I don't think that Jordan Hall is quite as mythological in his thinking or symbolic in his thinking, but he does definitely see how the different layers of things are stacked up. And he recognizes what's at the center, what, um, what, is, the, um, what is the core thing that we have to get right before we can stack the other levels on top of it. So when he says this, that um, it's sperm plus egg plus womb, what, and then it's the rest of the context, what he's saying is whatever the context is that causes this life, this life um, impetus of the sperm to the egg to the womb to, co to come into being in the right way that once we get that right we stack everything else stacks on top of it and all of the different layers are really just um are just a fractal representation of the same thing and i thought that was just a great answer so this is why again this image of the nativity is so vitally important because what it's showing us is what is the right context for human life. Um, it's not merely showing us a family scenario, but kind of a cosmic situation in which the human being exists and what the role is and um, what the structure of life is supposed to be. I talked about this in my video when I talked about the masculine and feminine vocation. The once we have identified what the feminine vocation is, then we realize what the masculine vocation is. The feminine vocation is first, it is a paradigmatic vocation. And it is first because it is the one that defines what the masculine vocation is. The feminine vocation is always a <laughs> call to be a mother and whether this is a physical mother or it is means motherhood in terms of the way Goldberry was in the in the book in treating her guests or whether it is mothering in terms of teaching all of the different roles that women have that are all aspects of mothering once we realize that that's the feminine vocation and even marriage is called holy matrimony, it's not called holy patrimony, it's called holy matrimony. Then what is the masculine vocation? The masculine vocation is to make the feminine vocation possible and to make it fruitful. And that is what the image or the icon of the nativity shows us. 
because it shows us this feminine vocation, which is the paradigmatic human vocation that is made possible by God. From that, once we understand that, then we can build all of the other elements in all of the social, all of the economic, the family life, everything, but we start there. That is why I really liked what Jordan Hall said, because he really knows how to dive right at the core of an issue. I did notice that Paul Vanderclay is going to be talking to him soon and I'm very much looking forward to their conversation. I think it will be fascinating. So I hope that this has all tied together, I tried to tie together kind of a number of things, starting with my thoughts about the nativity and then going into this um, beautiful image, I think, of femininity shown in um, J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. And then um, the Lorca of, um, of St. Patrick and how he is, how that prayer is so masculine and showing the masculine role in relation to the natural order. And then um, the commentary that Jordan Hall has been making about how we need to build a new kind of society and whether we will be successful in that. We will only be successful in that if women can uh, reclaim their role, their femininity and their beauty so that they can direct the attention of men to the building of a civilization that um, is a civilization of life and a civilization of love. Pope John Paul II warned, and this was like 30, 40 years ago, he warned that um, men were in danger of falling and that they needed women to keep them from falling. So let's see if we can support each other and keep each other from falling. We are in ever greater danger and um, we must support one another and help one another. Let's put an end to the war of the sexes and get back to our common vocation of the pursuit of holiness. Until we're together again, treat yourself as though you are someone you are responsible for helping because you are responsible. So am I, and together we are making the world. Bye for now. Thanks so much for watching.